Welcome to the Always Better Than Yesterday YouTube channel. I am your host, Ryan Hartley. This channel is for heart-centered leaders just like you. I hope our time spent together helps you leave a heart print where those around you are left better than yesterday. These interview sessions are sponsored by our great friends at Elevate Online Marketing. On episode 182, I'm joined by Joshua Luke Smith. Joshua is a poet, an artist, and an author. Here at Team Hartley, we absolutely love Joshua's heart work. We love listening to his music, and we have been able to experience it live in person on a couple of occasions. Joshua has just released his first book, Something You Once Knew, and it was great to sit down with him and have a great conversation about that book, as well as his debut album, The Void, which released last year. You can get all the good links to his book, to his community, to his podcast, and to his music in the show notes. And here we go, episode 182 with Joshua Luke Smith. Enjoy, my friends. Joshua Luke Smith, welcome to the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast. Life is beautiful. (laughs) <laughs> ain't it beautiful ain't it beautiful <laughs> <laughs> what gives you the audacity to say that with such defiance <laughs> well that's it man it's a defiant thing to say it's it's actually it's an absurd thing to say the more the more you live and the more you live through and so for me it's kind of a, a relief valve in the morning just to announce it life is beautiful ain't it beautiful and a, as you know to call something beautiful if you watch a film at the end of the film that was a beautiful film what yeah. did you mean by that you didn't mean it was pretty you didn't mean it was nice. You meant there was a story that enamored you. There was something that captured you. There was something that propelled you into appreciating being here at all. And so it's a very kind of ecclesiastical, existential <laughs> statement. <laughs> yeah, I love that, man. We uh, we were fortunate enough to shout that back at you twice at Big Church. I, I saw you, ago. bro. I saw you. I saw yeah. you in the crowd. Oh, my, my kids are, are big fans of your work. We we love the, we love, I think the great gift that you have is to be able to take words for something that so often transcends this little thing right here, right? I mm, oh, appreciate it's that. It's amazing. And and uh, you wrote it. So we came to see your album launch show back in, uh, I think it was last year in Moles. And, yeah. and you wrote in this little thing to my kids, you said, Corey and Brooke, there is something in you the world needs so they were absolutely buzzing when they got to see you and 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 you perform with your team and and with your wife and good friends so yeah man that was amazing but i'd love to talk about your beautiful book yeah this uh something you once knew man like Mm. how was that of a as an act of creation yeah i mean it was such a different experience than anything i've done before you know i've I've written poems since as long as i can remember i wrote my Mm. first poem when i was nine fell in love with hip hop in my early teens. I've always written songs. I've always I've always desired to write a book more than anything because I love reading and I love mm-hmm. getting to the end of a book and thinking, man, there was so much breadth, you know, so much journey here. I'd love to be able to do that one day. But I've never really considered what I would write about until yeah. I was actually approached. And I, I feel very fortunate for this, very, very fortunate about this. I was approached by, a, by an editor and she said, I think, I think there's a book. I think there's a book there, and I thought, man, mm-hmm. do you know what? If 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 I can have the freedom just to write stories from the last decade, and along the way find really what I want to say in that, then I'm down mm-hmm. to do this. And that's what the book was. It was it was a retelling of the last ten years of my life and the significant stories and ideas that have shaped who I am today and continue to shape me. And um, and so in some ways, it's quite it's it's quite sectioned, the book like the, the chapters could almost stand alone like essays, but actually they come together with this, hopefully with this kind of idea of reminding you of something that perhaps you've forgotten along the way and pulling you back into a story that's quite easy to drift away from. And and there's me thinking that there's some kind of biblical reference to the title and then I'm reading it and it's like <laughs> you're inspired by Inception, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's it. Man. That's my favorite film, and and it's it's the opening scene, yeah. um, which is just so powerful. I remember the first time I watched it, I didn't really get it. I didn't really appreciate it. But that's <laughs> yeah. a, that's Inception, isn't it? And yeah. then I watched it a second time. I watched it with my family, and it was it was after quite a dramatic loss. I'd lost a friend, mm-hmm. and the opening scene just startled me, man. It just grabbed me. And I began thinking about friendship in respect to this opening scene where, where Leo speaks to the character Sato and says, 
I've come to remind you of something. And Seto is this old man because in the dream world you age and the time, you know, space continuum is so mad. You know, Leo's a young man. He's an old man. He says, I came to remind you to come back for this world is not real. Come back so we can be young men together again. I came to remind you of something you once knew. And I thought, man, that is such a beautiful picture of life here. And it's what you're doing in your work and with this podcast and the the, the work that you do as a coach and just reminding people that this mm. story isn't over and that, it, that there's still something to be running after and to be hopeful about. And uh, yeah, it's, it's beautiful work you do, man. Oh, thank you, man. That's very kind of you. And I think your story starts as a ministry kid. Is that right? Yeah, takes, absolutely. It takes yeah. you far from these shores. Where did it yes. take you? And yeah, you know, so, how do you pack that into a, a, a little lesson for us? Yeah, well, I, I grew up in Northern Pakistan and it was all that I knew. My parents were missionaries which simply put, they just wanted to help people. And uh, my dad, my dad is a doctor. So he, he looked at the gifts that he has and the training yeah. he has and went to a region where they needed it. They really needed what he did. So we, he set up a hospital and he just day in, day out, did eye surgery for people that would have otherwise wow. gone blind. And wow. we lived in this very rural, very impoverished area, but it was all I knew. And so my childhood was playing in the foothills of the Himalayas, you know, and just <laughs> loving life. And coming back to England was actually the sort of the dynamic shift. Coming mm -hmm. back to England was what was strange. Yeah. And, um, and Pakistan, Pakistan genuinely, it taught me two things predominantly when I reflect on it. One was the, the tapestry of humanity is, is wide and diverse and eclectic mm. and beautiful, you know, mm. and it's not, it's not everyone that gets to experience such an eclectic image of humanity from such an early age. Yeah. And, but, but secondly, it told me something's broken, <laughs> you know, something, something isn't right because we, I grew up around poverty and I grew up around incredible expressions of pain. And, um, and so mm. I, I, I saw that I bear witness to that from a young age and yeah. my life has been, you know, been been an act of celebrating the former celebrating this beautiful diverse tapestry that we have and i guess trying to use my voice and lend my hands to whatever i can do to help walk in in the area of our brokenness as yeah. well that's powerful man and you know i i so this weekend i'll be i'll be running a little event to celebrate five years of our always better than yesterday community beautiful. um and, and some of the questions are coming back to me around what are some of the lessons what does it mean to create a community and and, and how do you kind of do that tactically um man like i just absolutely love your description of community um in your built in a dream within a dream mm. um just some of the words that you find for what it means to create a community and and i guess how have you you know being a being a, a missionary and traveling and how do you find this thing called belonging oh man it's a good question that's it's that's a huge question i appreciate <laughs> it because there's there's a belonging with people and there, then there's a belonging within ourselves and with god which is just a lifelong journey a lifelong excavation mm -hmm. you know for me, with people, it, all, it begins and ends with vulnerability. It begins and ends with allowing ourselves to be seen for who we truly are. Mm -hmm. Because you and I both know you can be in community. You can be in a team. You can be in a workforce. You can be in a church. You can be, you can be around people, but still present something which isn't completely who you are yeah. and um yeah it's, it's a difficult it's a very difficult thing to even uh, you know acknowledge the question of who am i and often i talk about this in the book but often it's the people around us that reveal it to us mm. that they're, they're almost are the mirror you can't see mm. unless you were on zoom right now you can't see yourself and so it requires me to tell you an element and ex expression of who you are that you'll never be able to see without me but yeah. but for me to be able to do that I need to be able to see you. And so I need to connect with you and engage with you in a way where there isn't a mask. And, you know, just using the pandemic as an example, we have now very objectively, very externally seen what it looks like for people to walk around with masks. Mm. We spent two years not fully being able to appreciate what someone's face is, you know, like, mm. what do you actually look like? And I think it's a powerful parallel for the inward expression that we have, where yeah. what do you actually look like? And, you know, that can be begin with something as simply as simple as replying with the most honest response to how's your day been? 
Mm. It doesn't have to be everything, but it can simply be, it's been a tough day. Mm. You know, just trying that, bro, is a game changer. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or it's been incredible. Why has it been incredible? And actually allowing yourself to celebrate what is good in your life and, um, and seeing those around you both celebrate with you and mourn with you gives you a deeper and deeper sense of belonging. Um, and then, and then I, I will just say as well, there's, a, there's an internal belonging. There's, there's a loneliness that we all experience because we're unique. There's no mm. one on this planet like you. And so there's no one that will actually be able to experience life as you do. And therefore, there's a loneliness in that. Mm. And, and the, path to, the path away from that loneliness I have found is through, ironically, the embracing of solitude, embracing spaces of being without and um and that slowly kind of that comfortability that comes with getting to know yourself yeah. getting to know who you are in silence when all the noise stops get to know who you are when no one else is speaking when you're not speaking is yeah. a real powerful act of learning to belong within your own body and within your own environment hey my friends thank you for being with us so far i hope you're enjoying the interview i just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about our signature heart print coaching our heart print coaching is for you if you're ready to go all in on becoming a heart-centered leader, ready to go all in on doing more of what you love, ready to see what you are capable of with support, guidance and accountability. You're ready to go on a rapid transformational journey that would change your life and others in as little as three months. Are you ready to show up with courage and share your gift with the world? Ready to start making an income and more impact by doing what you love. Ready to start leaving your legacy where those around you are left better than yesterday. In our Heartprint Signature Coaching, in our time together, I'll help you lead from your heart set. I'll help you develop other people and your team. I'll help you bring your heart work to the world. I'll help you start leaving a legacy and capturing examples of your impact. I will help you be someone you love, to do more of what you love, and to serve people that you love. It's an amazing opportunity for someone who's ready to go all in and be a heart-centered leader. I'll throw in loads of other bonuses, including your life languages profile, uh, access to our Master Heart and Mind membership, and even some Always Better Than Yesterday merchandise. Head to abty.co.uk forward slash coaching to find out more, and I look forward to connecting with you very soon. That's abty.co.uk forward slash coaching. Here we go. Back to the interview. Peace, man. Like, and um, there's a. I love uh, your your recent album, The Void, uh, and I'll put the links in the show notes. And there's one of these songs that just just uh, you're collaborating. I can't remember the the, the lady's name, but you, I love the silence. Oh yeah, Kyra. Yeah, yeah. I love the silence. I'm like, oh man, I do not like. like for yeah. me personally, like I've got tinnitus, and like yeah, so yeah. silence has been something I've always tried to avoid in my life. Yeah. But there's so much goodness in finding spaces well, and places of silence you know, right yeah i mean i've never actually shared this but the the i don't know that i wrote that song because i don't like silence you know like <laughs> when i when i was writing it I, I was sat there with kyra and i was saying i want the chorus to be i love the silence because that's what i want to love yeah but i want the verses to be my real expression of you know this is where i'm at you know i've been drinking denial running from questions that live in my mind searching for answers that no man can find outside of himself i'll tell you i'm fine you know like and it's mm -hmm. only when i really find myself in silence am i confronted with these questions am i confronted with these elements of who i am that mm -hmm. i find most detestable and it's also in that place that i come to a deeper acceptance and affirmation of of my true self so it's a it's a very vulnerable thing I love that uh, two men can have this conversation and, uh, you know, two bearded men, I might add. That's it, cool. yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I've been reading a bit of the Tao Te Ching recently, and I think there was this one sentence that when a leader finds um, unity, they find selfhood. And I think that kind of alludes to that mm. that wider kind of, mm. that 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 your place within the mosaic. I know you use this yes. word mosaic quite a lot. And and I guess what is it that's inspired you about Cosmos and the work of mm. Carl, S Carl Sagan? Oh man, Carl Sagan helped me find God. <laughs> like yeah. Carl, Carl Sagan, and 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 those that do you know work like him work where we are considering our place in the universe. 
leads those the students of that kind of world it leads you into awe it leads you into wonder um it just it's so easy to live your life looking at the kind of square patch in front of you looking at your own problems and your own circumstance your own experience as the kind of the greatest expression of existence and then you look up and then you start considering just how unbelievably vast this creation is and our place in it and you can't help as the psalmist says you can't help but lift your eyes and mm -hmm. as you lift your eyes your perspective changes your circumstance might not but your perspective certainly does and i you know i just thought to myself that this is very ecclesiastical but there will be a time not too far away where no one will know my name not even those that have come from my family line yeah. will know who i am in the same way i don't know that you know i the the the, the the earliest person in my family that I feel a connection to without ever meeting would be my great grandfather, yeah. who was an artist. Yeah. But his father, I know nothing about, yeah. you know, and so it's not that long. And that just keeps you sober. It just keeps you humble. And, yeah. you know, Carl Sagan said, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes. He said, um, you'll never meet it, like you'll never meet in a hundred billion galaxies, another human like the one in front of you. Hmm. So be kind. You know, mm. just mm. be kind because mm. they don't exist anywhere else. And you could search for a hundred billion galaxies. Wow. And he's like, believe me, there's that, there's enough space for it, yeah, a, yeah. but they don't exist there. And yeah. all of that space and time, they don't exist, but they're here right now and they're in front of you. So why don't you appreciate them? And I, I that's just been very helpful for me. <laughs> I think we're in a wonderful time where conversations like this become little time capsules and, and people that we will never meet get to experience the heart of, of Ryan and Josh. And, yes. and I, and I love that line in defiant ones. I think it is where it's just like, where you're talking about your, your grandson listening yeah. to your tapes <laughs> in the basement, like yeah. my grandfather made this. <laughs> and, I, and I think what you're touching on is legacy. Mm. I think what you're touching on is the story you share about, um, uh, Doddridge and Wilberforce mm. in your book. Tell us a little bit about what you mean by that kind of legacy and, and impacting those we may not meet. Yeah, I remember hearing someone, I think it was in a sermon, say, you know, would you consider planting seeds that grow trees you never sit in the shade of? Mm. Oh, I love that line, you know. It's, it's actually... It's actually quite self-indulgent in an ironic way. So the thought of, I want to do something that I might not experience the harvest of feels very sort of sacrificial of like, I'm doing this for people I'll never meet. And it's very true. But actually what it does in turn is it gives me, it gives me something that's going to sustain the work that I do. You know this to be true. You, you, you put something out into the world and then when you extend, like instantly experience its impact or even hear like an affirmation for, for, from it. It's gratifying, but it doesn't last that long. <laughs> and, and suddenly you kind of, well, there's been a completion to this. All right. And someone's experienced it. So you kind of move on to the next thing. And that's fine. I know and I, that's, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But having the perspective of my life it has, the, has the potential of living beyond the years that I experience begins to slow you down and be more considerable about the work that you do, be more considerate about the work you do. And so I've started to think about, you know, my music, for example, you know, and I pondered that question. I was, I was in Nashville and I was having all these meetings with record labels and, and, and various industry people. And I was walking around downtown Nashville and I just said, will they say of me, I made it. I ain't here to get famous. I ain't here mm. for the playlist. I just pray they play this in years to come. Mm. And I said that line, bro, and I suddenly went, all right, it doesn't matter. Like, it, honestly, it doesn't matter if I don't get the playlist I want to get. And bro, I didn't. Like, this is this is what's really ironic. Let me. I never told this story, but when you release a new album, what you really want to hit on Spotify is the New Music Friday. You really want to get New Music Friday because it's the biggest playlist. It kind mm -hmm. of skyrockets your streams. It gives you loads of new kind of potential listeners, and. I, I released Defiant Ones as one of the singles from my album. And I really, I was like, if, if one of these songs is, is going to kind of break through, I want it to be Defiant Ones. Mm -hmm. And I woke up on the Friday it came out and it got no playlists. Mm -hmm. And it was just so ironic because I had said in that song, like, 
I ain't here for the playlist. I just play. And I just felt like it was a full circle yeah. moment of like, yeah, mm-hmm. like I'm putting work out into the world that I want to, yeah. I want to plant seeds that birth trees I don't get to sit in the shade of. The, mm-hmm. the irony of that's what keeps me working. That's what keeps me going. That's what keeps me loving. That's what keeps me kind of slowing down. So it's self-indulgent in the way that, mm-hmm. yeah, it's fruit that I might not get, but it's, it's actually empowering me to do the work and to plant seeds and to yeah. nurture the ground here and now in a way I probably wouldn't have done before. And, you know, I won't give the whole story away, but in the book I talk about a man called Philip Doddridge who, who just did great work and incredible work and prolific work. And yet the whole time he was doing it, he was suffering and he mm. was in obscurity. And yet his life, well, I won't give it all away, but his life, you know, reaped a harvest that is just extraordinary. And in our own ways, I think we all have the potential to have a similar impact. Mm. Well, what I'm about to say, you can't take to the bank in cash, but uh, just so you know, this is for the heart bank, Mm -hmm. that uh, as I took my daughter goodnight, I said, life is beautiful. And she said, ain't it beautiful? Oh, bro. (laughs) Oh, that's that's special. Man, I'm so grateful for your support and your interest in my work. It's very encouraging. Well, it's like, you you, you know, you had the courage to bring it to the world, my friend. And, uh, you know, through you, um, and through the gift that you share with the world in a similar way that you wrote to my children, there was something in you that the world needed. And, and, and we, we connect at a heart level with, with the, with the words that you, you share, my friend. And, Thank you, mate. um, this is so on the topic of becoming a father, you know, I, I, it was father's day this recent weekend here in the UK. And, and I was looking at your stories and, uh, I, I found it absolutely fascinating about how you describe the vulnerability of a parent. Do you remember what you said? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's nothing that I feel more is uniquely my mind to do uh, yeah. than being this little girl's father, and yet there's nothing I feel more underprepared to do than being this little girl's father. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's it's like um, I mean I mean for me personally, I didn't have the greatest of, of role models, so I'm I'm kind of doing this blind sort of thing. And you're right, man. Like I heard you. I think the words you used was "there's nothing so undeniably my responsibility." And I was like, yeah, yeah. "Yep, no days off." <laughs> yeah, that's it. No days off. It's, it is strange, isn't it? How the Father's Day comes along and it gives us a moment to reflect, mm. and it, it, all the kind of let's call it what it is like all the suffering that is within it suddenly is eclipsed by the affection that we feel towards these little people mm. who for so long really genuinely do give us nothing back um <laughs> but the affection is it eclipses everything else and yeah. it, yeah, it teaches you so much it teaches you so much about yourself <laughs> yeah one of my favorite tracks of yours is um, all my friends mm. and uh in that lyric it's about um they believe that the best is yet to come. Mm, mm. Like, I think that is a heart set. Like hope is a yeah. heart set. It's not a product yeah. of the mind. It's not an intellectual thing. It's, it's a hope set. Uh, it's a heart yes. set. And yes. I guess, you know, what gives you that hope? Oh, that's a good question. It's a really good question. Do you know what, what? One thing that keeps me hopeful is that I'm not ultimately the author of this story, this experience. That ultimately, like, I am not in control. That makes me hopeful. You know, there's, there's elements to the garden that I can, that I can nurture and I can, I, I can sow into, of, you know, of my life, obviously. But ultimately there is so much that's going to happen whilst I'm on earth that I have no control over. And w- what makes me hopeful about that if I, if, is if I was the only one in control, then I would be pretty hopeless because I, I know my capacity and I know, I know my tendencies. And yet it seems to me that despite all this calamity, we do live in a world that the most beautiful things come from the most painful. We do live in a world that seems to keep renewing itself, you know, and out of even the most difficult circumstances, something beautiful comes. And so my hope really is in that there is an author to the story and the author isn't fear. Like the author is writing something good and beautiful and ultimately redeemed um and that keeps me going man (laughs) Mm. yeah i love that and um one of my good friends she's currently reading your book at the moment i'm fortunate enough to be in her corner as her coach and Mm. um uh, a few of our conversations have been about um her life being so busy and very um little margin Mm. for when things go wrong and and then obviously she's reading your your chapter of your book that's talking about the margins and the context of life like 
So she's asking this question. She she wants to know how that she can begin to create some more margins in her life. Mm. Yeah, well, it's it's beautiful because it is so practical and it, it starts today or it starts tomorrow. Margin, th- th- there was a man that once gave me a Bible and he, he gave me this big margin Bible. So the text was quite small in the middle. And he gave me the Bible and he said, Josh, this, you know, this is for you, but this is an image for your life. Mm. Live with margin. Like the best parts of your life are going to come from the margin. The text in the middle is just incredible, but the text in the middle has no context if there isn't margin. And so margin genuinely, literally is space. Mm. And it kind of goes back to our conversation around silence. Sometimes silence and solitude is so like terrifying because there's nothing that instant- instantaneously seems productive about it. And so we kind of run from it because we don't instantly get something from it. And yet it's in that margin, it's in that space, everything else begins to make sense. So Mm -hmm. today, um, for for this woman listening, today, you know, when you would normally finish work, say at 5.30, and then you get home, and maybe the kids, I don't know, you you start doing the kids dinner around 6 p.m. and and your whole whole day just looks like it's back to back. Mm -hmm. Would you consider even if it's half an hour before you would normally just turn off the lights, would you consider just choosing a block of time as small as half an hour and naming it as space, naming it as margin? And Karen, my wife and I, what we do is we call them, we call them lifelines. So we, we, we each have 10 lifelines and these can range from anything from sitting in silence all the way to going to the gym. And they're things that instantaneously bring us life, not necessarily instantaneously give oh. us productivity. They just create life within us. So one of, one of my wives is sitting outside with a cup of Earl Grey tea. And so our margins, our daily margins, are defined by those 10 lifelines. What can we do, whether it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half an hour, or two hours, that gives us a margin. And it's, it's amazing how sitting in that space, whether it's in the gym, whether it's sitting outside in silence, whether it's listening to some music, instantly it's like the words that were running end to end of the page begin to find themselves closer in the middle. So mm-hmm. suddenly the words themselves, which I would kind of interpret as the activities of the day, the thoughts I've had in my mind, my interactions with people, all of that suddenly starts to become a little clearer, a little easier to decipher, a little mm-hmm. easier to digest. And then there's a weekly rhythm. We take, you know, we have a Sabbath, which is a day of a day of rest, and literally is a day of rest. The laptop closes, the phone goes off. We take time each month, and you 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 look at it even from an annual perspective, and suddenly the year begins to make sense in a way that mm. it didn't. In the same way, the words begin to make sense when they have space around them. So it's very simple. It's very practical, and it will initially really might feel uncomfortable, but it will cost you who you don't want to be. It will cost you a part of yourself, but it will cost you the part of yourself that you don't want to be. You don't want to be someone who's just busy for what? Mm. Just to be busy, just to keep going, you know? And uh, I found it to be incredibly life-giving. I, lo- I love that. And I think one of the uh, the metaphors that you that you gave in this chapter was about if we don't create those margins, it's like when we come to serve people, it's like serving them three-day-old lasagna. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they come around for dinner. You invite them for dinner, and all you're doing is heating up last week's food. Yeah, yeah. that was powerful. It made me chuckle. And you know, I, I think in your twenties you were a pastor, right? And I think it's such a gift to be able to walk alongside human beings in a human experience. And mm-hmm. and I feel grateful to have that experience and shared with people as a coach. And mm-hmm. you know, I, I guess what have you learned about the the, the fragility of the, of the human soul and the human spirit and the human experience? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a good question. I, I, I've, de- I've learned that every single day is unpredictable. And mm-hmm. I've learned that we need grounding and we need rooting in our everyday lives. I've realized that we all have a, a spiritual migration within us. We all have a desire to journey somewhere spiritually. Mm-hmm. And that looks different for every single person. But finding these anchors, this, this grounding spiritually um, is indispensable. And so, you know, working as a pastor, it was, it was a joy and as a pleasure. And I still do it in, in different ways. It's just helping people find that spiritual mooring in their life, that spiritual anchoring. Life is immensely unpredictable. You know, I'm walking, w- walking with someone at the moment who, who, who lost a spouse very, in a very shocking and unpredictable way. That's as real as it would be for me. Like, it's, 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 
his life has changed in just a moment. And yet I can genuinely see the spiritual anchoring, the spiritual mooring, the spiritual sense of belonging, like we talked about, of assurance that is keeping this person genuinely sane. And, and to be frank about it, is keeping them with the perspective that tomorrow is worth living, despite mm-hmm. what they've just gone through. Um, and so, yeah, I'm the first funeral I ever did was for a child. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I remember leaving the church and I stood outside just shook, you know, just, just trying to gather myself. I'd kind of made it through the service. And then the father of this child came and stood next to me and we just stood in silence. We looked at the sky and he said, he said this, the colors of the sky look beautiful, don't they? And I looked at the sky and I looked at him and I thought, we've just buried your daughter and you're commenting on the beauty of the sky like this couldn't be a more profound image of the human experience mm-hmm. that we are both living in this continual state of grief. Like we are, we're just, we're grieving what could have been constantly and we're enamored by what is constantly. And I almost feel like those are the two ingredients to live a full and healthy life, you know, to have a, have a, have a, have a deep and honest expression for your lament and a deep and honest expression for your awe is um is just a critical critical element for being a healthy human Mm. thank you for sharing that Mm. this podcast exists to encourage the heart-centered leader within people and and the 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 first section of your book is about don't worry about leading just yet Mm. let's let's re-establish the old um virtue of being a good follower Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> which is great great like i've never wanted to follow like yeah, yeah, yeah. this this is where the reason why i resisted being a man of faith for so long i wasn't following anybody yeah, 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 <laughs> it's yeah. something that i'm continually learning to surrender and surrender is my least favorite word but what, <laughs> you know, what is the ancient art of following to you yeah i mean we've kind of we've kind of lost it in our society at large it still exists but even when i was growing up you know, we would we would talk a lot about in school. I grew up in a kind of working class town, and most of the young men would go on to become an apprentice for bricklayers and electricians and carpenters. And um, I say we've lost it just because there's so many more, more options now, and that, that's not a bad thing. But our society at one point was heavily dependent upon being an apprentice to someone and learning a trade from someone, and. Um, there's a deeply kind of spiritual reality in that as well of putting yourself as a lifelong apprentice and Mm -hmm. so for me in my faith walk and tradition it's jesus um and jesus whatever you know of jesus his trade was carpentry he was a carpenter um but he was also a rabbi a spiritual teacher and so the manner in which people followed him was deeply like an apprentice they would follow the rabbi and they would learn what he did and how he spoke and how he ate and how he prayed and how he interacted with people and there's this really interesting point in the scriptures where a roman uh soldier comes to jesus and he's heard that he's been doing miracles and he comes and he he asks jesus to perform a miracle and Jesus says to him, I will, because I too am a man under authority. And he recognizes in the Roman soldier that this Roman has put himself under a kind of a military authority. But Jesus is saying, I too am under authority, under God's authority. And mm-hmm. what I've learned is being under authority gives authority. And learning to follow actually develops you to become an even better leader. Why? Because it keeps you humble. And, you know, we both know what it's like to be around a leader who isn't humble. Mm. They might be directional. They might be full of vision. They might be powerful, but they don't empower. Like they don't, they don't strengthen in a way that sustains someone else. So they might be great at breaking down walls and breaking ground, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to build. And ultimately what I want to do as a leader is I want to build, man. I want to build people. I want to build culture. And so I'm learning every day to stay humble and, and to be humble it begins with, I think, following of saying, I don't have all the answers. I'm dependent. I've surrendered and I, I'm with you, man. Surrender in that's a difficult thing to do. <laughs> Not my will be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> it is daily advancement and learning in that. On the cover of your book, it looks like a laundrette. What's the yeah. significance of that? 
Well, my, my life had a huge turning point in a laundrette. Um, and I've, I, I've decided, I told my wife and I told my publisher, I'm not going to tell the story um, for a few months until the book's out in the world. But my life did change in a laundrette. And you can read why it happened in the book. But, yeah, yeah. but what I will say, and this is the tagline of the book, you know, waking up to the extraordinary in our ordinary life. If it can happen to me in a laundrette that my whole world is turned upside down, yeah. it can happen to you anywhere. And it's a little, it's a little nod to the ancient Hebrew story of Moses, who who ends up talking to God from yeah. a bush in the desert, yeah, which yeah. sounds incredible to us, but in reality, it was a very mundane experience. He was in the desert; it was hot. Bushes catch fire, and yet he he took the time to notice it was burning and yeah. not consumed. And it's an encouragement to us to just to define our life as a holy, holy, as holy ground and to define each moment as having the possibility um, and of, of surprising us. So, yeah, <laughs> I know I haven't given much away. But. I, I know. Good. I'm glad you've not. It's uh, you go get the book. Have a have a little read. It is. Uh, I just love stuff like well, when that comes <laughs> out. And, and there's a couple of like stories you say when something happens and then the, the punchline. And and I guess that. Um, I guess that just comes with the spirit of, of, uh, of just being able to recognize that awe and wonder that like you talk mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, it's not walking around constantly looking at the sky, like, Oh my goodness. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it can be, it can be, but I think more than anything, it's living with an open heart, you know, it's yeah, yeah. living with a heart that has forgiven and a heart that, a heart that finds it hard to judge, you know, a heart sure. that finds it hard to define the moment because there's a possibility of it changing hard to define the man because mm. there's a possibility of him changing you know so yeah yeah, yeah. well uh, the, the thing i was reading this morning is that you will find an enemy at the end of your judgment and fear and yet you will find a neighbor at the end of your compassion and i think that yeah. that as a sentence is something that i'd love to encourage our listeners and our leaders out there to 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 realize that you know, whether it's community, whether it's a team, whether it is in a church mm. or in a family, if we can bring our hearts mm. for compassion for other human beings, yes, yes. We, we can love our neighbor as we love ourselves, right? Yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy, <laughs> but but yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And someone asked me actually, like, how do you how do you get more compassion for someone? And I said, I think it actually begins with having more compassion for yourself, you know. And allow right. yourself each each morning to receive mercy. Um, it's it's interesting because the thing that we're often most critical about in someone else is the thing that we're most critical about it within ourselves. It just yeah. happens that they're the mirror of it, and they we yeah. we react to it because we know it's true within us. Yeah. It's why Jesus says, you know, before you start talking about the speck in someone else's eye, look at the mm. the, the the two by four in your own eye, you know. Yeah. And it's just beautiful wisdom. It's so it's so beautiful. Before you throw a stone. Before, before you judge, just look at where you've actually already judged yourself. So what do you do? Give yourself some mercy. Mm. Give yourself some grace. And mercy begets mercy. Jesus says, blessed are those who are, most, are merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And I'd say the opposite is true. Blessed are those who give mercy. You know what mm. I mean? Like, it's, it's just... It's just powerful. Like, it's a powerful cycle to give and receive mercy. Give and receive mercy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the uh, words you just used there was mirror, and it just takes me back to seeing you you perform live. It's wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> what does that mean? Wherever you go, you are there. You are now. What does that yeah, symbolize? The, the, we're always looking for a there. When I get there, you know, but there is just another here. You mm. know, this is when you get there. It will be a here. Here you are. And so this moment right now at nine at ten thirty eight on a Tuesday morning. Here we are. And he will be in the next minute and the next hour. And so if we don't learn the things that are being offered to us right now. Like what? Like learning to love ourselves. Like learning to appreciate this moment. Guess what? We will not appreciate the moment to come. You know, it just won't happen. It's illusion and it's fantasy. So it's it's kind of like the I'll start the diet on Monday idea. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. It's, it's the, just start today with the most profound human could do or be. And that is, I'm going to choose to love myself. I'm going to choose to love God. I'm going to choose to love my neighbor. In fact, bro, I'm actually writing a song at the moment. I'm, I'm working on it today. And it's, it's, um, 
I say this to my daughter every morning. And then just the other day, I was thinking, oh, I think maybe some other people might hit, hit, they need to hear this. I walk into a room and she's standing up in a car and I go, welcome to another day of being loved, of being yeah. enough, of being everything that you've been dreaming of. Welcome to another day of being you, you know? Come on. Welcome. Today's Let's beginning. Go. And I thought, man, I need to hear that, man. Oh. I need to hear that. Welcome to another day of being loved. Like here is enough. This is good. Life is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's, um, oh, it's, it's no small thing to say it, to announce it. You know, and, and it kind of just correlates so much. Everything I try and do with our leaders is just trying to help them have this heart set of having all that they need. That mm -hmm. being able to come to the world from the overflow, already being loved, already having enough, already being provided for. And uh, man, I can't That's wait good. to hear that. Can't wait to hear that track. Um, <laughs> I'd love to know what it means to surrender to the void. Oof. Oof. It's a good question. Um, what does it these, mean? To these are your words, my friend. <laughs> these are your words. Yeah, no, I know. I know. <laughs> no, I, it, it's a lifelong journey. It, and it, it, it's the acknowledgement that having... Having the answer, and I'm pausing because it's not a, it's not it's not a small thing. It, to, to acknowledge that I don't have the answer, to to acknowledge that being certain about something isn't going to make me secure about something, you know. Uh, we 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 have this tendency to think if we just knew the answer, we would feel like a level of security, and it's just not the case. You know, I was in London last week, and all the trains north got got stopped because of a fire. And the train station, London Euston, was just filled with people so angry. And understandably, it was, you know, it was throwing all their plans out. But it was just one man in the middle who had a, who had a clipboard and a, a walkie-talkie. And he was the representation for the train line. And, bro, there was probably 50 people around him. And just, they were so angry. And I was looking at him. And, and I made my way through the crowd. And everyone's like saying, but, but when will you know? And, and, and when will the next train be going? How do you not know if there's going to be a train going tonight? And I said to him, I was like, bro, you're doing really well. And he went, I'm just doing the best I can. Mm. And what I thought to myself was, this guy is holding space for uncertainty. He can't give an answer. Wow. And he can see that in everyone else's lack of certainty, all this rage and suffering is coming out. And so to surrender to the void is to surrender to the vastness, to this absolute kind of unquantifiable experience mm -hmm. of being human. It says in Proverbs, it's the glory of God. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. Why? Because it's the glory of men to search it out. And so the, actually the most fulfilling part of our life is not knowing. The most fulfilling part of our life is being on this quest, in this seeking. And um, it didn't make it better it didn't make the people's plans better or, or take away the fact that these trains being canceled was disruptive, but you watch them slowly realize, Oh, I'm not going to know if I can get home tonight. Mm -hmm. I might have to book a hotel. I'm going to have to call a friend and stay there. And there was this sort of surrendering to the fact that I'm not going to get the answer from this man. And genuinely, I'm not just saying it, this kind of peace, this like, all right. And they stopped, they stopped, they stopped shouting and they stopped getting angry and they slowly began walking away. And, you can do that quicker and quicker as you grow older. You can let go quicker. Um, so the last line of the voice says, I used to, um, I see it's in the mystery that I am free. Though I've searched for certainty, now I'm coming back to me. I'm coming back to who I am because I've actually lost myself in trying to have an answer for everything. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Coming back to me now. Mate, grateful for you. Grateful for you sharing your heart and soul with the world. Um, I'll share all your good links in the in the show notes. I just urge anyone that's listening to go and check out. And do you know what? Put Joshua on your on your Spotify playlists. You know, he might <laughs> might, not, might not be on the Friday playlist, but he, hopefully he is on all of your playlists now. Um, Joshua, thank you so much for your time, brother. I really, really appreciate it. I'd be honored if oh, you'd leave joy. us with a final thought from your good self. Well, it's 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 just a joy to be with you and a joy to be with your listeners and uh May you stay curious. I'll leave you with that. May you stay curious. May life keep surprising you. May today, whenever this day is that you're listening to this podcast, may this day meet you like a burning bush in the desert and surprise you with a voice that uh, just awakens something even deeper within you. So, yeah. Mm, love that. Thank you, brother. Absolutely. Thanks for having me.
Thank you for making it to the end of the interview here on YouTube. I hope that our time spent together has left you a little bit better than before you push play. Before you go anywhere, please leave a comment down below. Some of your key reflections, your key takeaways. I love hearing from you and what this conversation has inspired in you. Let me know what you're going to do as a result of this conversation. I will be back next Wednesday where I will share another inspiring guest. To make sure that you don't miss that, please do subscribe, hit the bell and you will be notified as soon as it goes live. If you're curious to know how I, through Always Better Than Yesterday, can serve you, your team, your organisation, please do visit alwaysbetterthanyesterday.com and it will be my honour and privilege to help you in any way I can. Keep leading my friends. I've been Ryan Hartley, host of the Always Better Than Yesterday podcast here on YouTube. Always love.